There are many different types of families out there, and I think if there's one thing that's important for everybody to know, it's that family doesn't always necessarily mean blood, and that's one thing that we all definitely have in common. I think that being adopted is really, it's a, it's a, I think being internationally adopted is a very tough thing to talk about. And I think, as you can see, I'm having a huge trouble just explaining my inner thoughts. My name is Grace Hill. I am 21 years old and I was adopted from China. I never had to have a sit down talk with my parents about being adopted. I think inside I just knew, um, but it really wasn't a big deal. I didn't make a big deal out of it, I don't think. I just kind of said, oh, well, that's my life, so carry on. It's really not anything spectacular. And I don't think being adopted should define me, but then again, it is a huge part of my identity. My name is Lane Binkley. I'm 66 years old, and I grew up in Manhattan. My name's Mike Hill. I'm 70 years old. I grew up in Western Pennsylvania and South Jersey. We started with the application in 1997, and initially it's a a long, detailed, complicated application which you send in. First you sign up for an, ado an adoption agency and we went around and interviewed about four or five of them before we settled on this outfit in Tianek, mainly on the strength of we felt we had a connection with the lady that uh, ran the thing, or uh, ran the Chinese part of it. Once you uh, choose that they kind of guide you through it, but um, it's a, a long, uh, complicated application. Then once everything is in place, then you wait. And we waited for most of a year, I think, before I was um, sitting at work one day and um, our uh, person at the agency called and said, what's your fax number? And I gave her the fax number and she said, get ready, I'm sending you a picture. She sent a picture of, uh, of Grace. And she says, this is your child. At that point, you, um, you start planning the trip. You have to learn to speak the language of your ancestors. Oh, that's, that's right, final. that's right, that's right. All right. I'll find out a seat assignment. Pronto. Oh. Yeah, that's a good opening line, right? <laughs> Excuse me, what's your seat assignment, sir? Come here often? What's today, Mikey? Today is, why well, it's the 8th, I believe. Yeah, this could take Something a while. Something special today? Uh, pirates in town? What? Yeah. Something's going on. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> did you see? Did you show the view? Oh yeah. We get it. Are we going to have enough film left for the baby? Because uh, yeah. you see our mugs the whole time. I know. This is okay. Oops, here today. We see more of the harbor. Here she goes. Oh, she just learned to crawl today, and she is motoring like a demon. She's the cameras making her like. She's saying, I uh, I'm not ready for my close up. Uh, I like this medium shot. Uh, especially after we uh, got Grace and we would be on the street with her in a little stroller walking along. Uh, Zhangjiang is not a cosmopolitan city. It's not like Shanghai or Beijing where people are used to Westerners. Um, the only Westerners that were there were there to adopt <laughs> and there's not that many. So Lane especially with her red hair, often attracted a crowd of people who were absolutely fascinated with her. They would also notice the little Chinese baby in the stroller, and um, almost invariably, they would say, lucky girl. 
The question that I've been thinking about lately is what if? That's it. What if I wasn't a cute baby? What if I had behavioral issues? What if I had health issues? Would I still be here today if I had such problems? And it's the whole thing about fate. Like, what? It's insane. Because it's like, why me? Why was I put in this situation? Why was I granted this family? Why? Why? And what if that never happened? Where would I be now? It's, it's challenging to think about. At the time that we adopted from China, it was a very big, popular thing to do in this part of the country. It was all the rage, I should say. Everyone on the Upper West Side had a Chinese daughter, it seemed to me. And everyone was all about honoring the Chinese heritage and going to Chinese classes and doing the traditional dances and eating the traditional food and celebrating Chinese New Year, on and on and on and on and on. So, which I think is, is in a lot of ways, a, a good thing to do. However, <laughs> uh, we didn't do it. <laughs> Um, and I think the real reason we didn't do it was not because we didn't want to honor Grace's heritage, but simply because it seemed to me that all of that stuff was really more about the mother and the dad wanting to feel good about themselves in terms of doing that, that they were enjoying the idea that they were fostering this child from another country and giving them something of their own heritage and then it was really more about them than it was about the kid because you t you show me a three-year-old child who wants to take Chinese lessons I am strictly American that's how I was raised um, but that almost makes me feel like a fraud because obviously I look Asian I look Chinese and then you know sometimes I get people who are Chinese um, speak to me in Mandarin or Cantonese and I can't understand what they're saying and I say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't speak that. And it makes me feel bad because it, it's as if I need to know how to speak the language because I was born and I am from China. And then there's other issues with that as well. You know, it's funny, I uh, grew up with a parent who had a disdain for anything conventional in terms of family, and so I kind of uh, assumed that. You know, you say you get things from your parent, you, you, uh, I assumed that attitude unconsciously myself um, because that was the way my mother was. However, I realized in retrospect that it, um, it wasn't the ideal kind of a, an upbringing at all, and it, but to be honest with you, I only really missed having a, f a real family after we got Grace. And I realized geez, how great it would be to be one of those big, happy families with cousins next door, with... Um, Jew or Italian. Yeah, ethnic, family. ethnic, you know, not wasps who have nothing. I mean, just, you know, they're boring. We're boring. We have nothing and we're, at, you know, we're just not connected and we don't have even a food that we all eat. None, none of that tradition do we have uh, to share with our child. And it was only after, and, and, it, and it doesn't get any better. Even the older she gets, I think, oh, I wish I had a sister to, she could stay with, or I wish I had a, a close uh, uncle that she would, get, you know, get, he would give her a nice trip when she graduates, or any of that stuff that people that I know just have, as a matter of course, simply because of the, where they landed in the, in, in the universe. So, it, not to be, oh, poor me about it, because there were some advantages in growing up in New York with a, a weird single mom, but it, there were also a lot of non-family things that, that occurred. And I, I, I basically didn't have much of a family life when I was a kid. I was a latchkey kid. So that's another thing that I wanted to uh, uh, not, again, like, like Mike was saying, I wanted to go in the other direction totally and provide a, an enormous amount of stability. And I hope that we've done that. I think that we have for our child. We've tried. We've tried very hard to do that. So that when you're going back to your original question about you know, being Chinese or being American, to me, being being wanted 
and being loved and being safe, to me, those were the things that I wanted to have for her. Did you um, consider getting another child? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would, may, may have daydreamed about it. Oh, but, I day, still daydream yeah, about it. But it, it really was never a viable option Guess, to, to do that. No, we're too old. We're too old and, too, <laughs> and it, it's too expensive to, for us to contemplate. No, it. it's not too Love expensive. to be able to do it. Love to have been able to give Grace a sister. Oh my gosh, coming to you. <laughs> hey. hey! Welcome home! Yeah! Hello. My name is Maggie Pregian and I was domestically adopted out of the state of New Jersey. I have five siblings and I have two gay dads. We were together... Eight years. Eight years and they passed a law that we could foster but we couldn't adopt and so we went for our classes and we took the classes to be foster parents. I had been out of another foster home that was a few towns over and it wasn't the best for me. The class doesn't really prepare you for, um, for being a foster parent um, because you don't get all the information. So the answer to your question is you are given so much information and then once you're, uh, you've gotten your foster license, you can get a call at any time of the night. <coughs> and um, basically um, you're at their beck and call and that's how it worked. Um, on my first visit with my parents, I believe they did take me to a park and I didn't want to leave. I honestly had so much fun running around, playing, you know, just sitting on the swings and stuff like that. I really just didn't want to leave. And my parents were like, we want her. That's a good child. <laughs> um, so I guess from the very beginning, I've been a happy baby. When you have kids, they become your priority and your life pretty much goes on the side and everything is done for your children. We always wanted a family. Um, we did everything backwards, um, as you know. We had our kids first, and then we got married um, 24 years after, and we're together 27 years, so. Yeah, most people's parents, they get married uh, before they even have kids, so like it's always like, oh, how did you guys meet? When did you get married? What was the weather on the day of? But like us, it was like we grew up with our parents, like we witnessed them, like, you know, we all went to different... Uh, courthouse meetings and the amount of times we woke up at six o'clock in the morning just to drive down to Trenton. I had a dot every every period make sure your kids were always like so that there's nothing anyone could possibly say because we were really the starter not us the families that started at the same time as us um, we really were gonna set the example whether they did the right thing passing the law or not passing the right law for other couples to be able to do it so, you know, it was a lot of pressure. We went on a cruise in 2003-2004, which was actually the subject of another documentary. And we were one of the families that was actually put in that documentary. And my parents, you can actually see them, you know, do like their vows and everything on the boat. Obviously, it wasn't legal for them to marry at the time, but it was essentially a marriage that they did um, on the boat, which is like super heart touching. Um, but one of the earliest instances of discrimination that I do remember was on that boat as well. It was filled with um, families that, you know, had gay parents and they had kids. And so it was all these families, all these happy people that knew they wouldn't be discriminated on this boat. And the cruise went down to like the Caribbean kind of. So we stopped to go to Nassau and Full churches were out on the island screaming, protesting, yelling at us, telling us we were going to go to hell, we were going to burn, and it. I was about seven years old at the time, and that was terrifying. When we did it, we were really under a microscope, and they were just looking for us to fail. You know, or, um, you know, then you had all the taboos, you know, gay people. You know, gay people were child molesters. We raised our children to be gay. I don't know if you know that. And we failed miserably. <laughs> yeah. um, we didn't do very good. So we probably lost our gay cards. Um, 
I could go. I make light of it because that's the best way to do it. Otherwise, probably you'd cry. Um, it was hard. It was hard. You know, my identity is something that will keep me going. You know, I will always protect those who I love. You know, if I consider you part of my family, whether you're blood or not, I will protect you. You know, that's exactly how that goes. And that's something that my family learned growing up. Because, you know, people would say stuff, people would be like, well, where are your real parents? Where is your mom? And things like this. And I'm like, this is my family. I don't need this from you. I don't want it from you. You know, I will choose not to interact with you. Our plan was to have a boy and a girl. And we both had successful businesses. And we were going to travel around the world. And that was the goal. And of course it didn't work out that way because we ended up with six kids, didn't we? So having so many siblings is crazy. It's never dull. Hi everybody! Stop! Stop! Stop. 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 Yes, Father? <laughs> Do I have them in right? I feel like they'll fall out. No, just go like this. They won't fall out. I work out with them in. Oh. They're falling out. No, they're not. You're so silly. Help me! Help me! Can you see my feet? Yes. This is gonna look legit. I'm gonna put this over us and I'm gonna lift them up as well. You know that vine that's like, this is legit. It is! Me being one of the youngest, I, you know, I always have someone to talk to or someone, you know, if I need help on homework, there's at least one person good at math or one person good at science. It was great. Honestly, growing up, we were all really, really close. We did everything together. You would not see one, you would see five. These all stayed together. You knew it probably was hard for us, so you always stuck together. Um, these were very close, knit together. Um, you did everything together. We're just proof that, you know, that not every family is the same. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're literally proof of that. You could love who you want. And it's okay to raise foster kids. And it's kind of fun because they're both funny, nice. Yeah. People are always like, why are they white? Why are you black? And I'm just like, well, you know, I'm adopted. There was actually one incident when I was younger, middle school, where a girl told me that she couldn't be friends with me because I had two dads. And I was little, I didn't understand it. And I was like, oh, what? Like, okay. Like, I'm, my, I'm, I am not, you know, my parents. I can be like them, but either way, it's, regardless of who they are, it doesn't matter. They're a part of me, so. Being adopted, you know, having people be like, don't you ever want to find your real parents? You know, being not white, being not straight, all of these things that have been with me for a very long time, they have just shaped how I look at this life how I interact with other people, and how I deal with haters, honestly. As funny as that sounds, like how I deal with haters. Her mother's mother said, aunt said to me, Verna, that's my name, are you gonna take Rihanna or do you want me to take her? I said, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, I'm gonna tell you like this baby, that's my baby, and you will not raise her. I will. Maybe you will help, but you can't have her. And I meant that. My name is Brianna Shepard, and this is me talking about my life. My father had to take matters into his own hands because it was a very complicated process. The first thing I had to do is clear the hurdle of being able to take you home from the hospital. I had to go and file custody down at the courthouse for you. Emergent, it was um, done on the emergency basis because your mo your mother was laying on life support. She was on life support for seven days, and then she officially passed April eleventh, nineteen ninety six. Everything was happening so fast, but I know I had to keep, you know, smiling and everything because on one hand, I'm losing your mom, 
And then, then I got this new baby, so emotionally, it was just like a ripping thing going on. I went down to the courthouse, and I had to apply for permanent custody of my own child. I've never heard of such thing. I thought you was mine, but legally, you weren't. You belonged to the state. <laughs> so I had to get legal um ownership of you, of you like 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 your like your piece of property mm. so i had to go there filed for it had to go get an emergency hearing from the judge the same day we went the in. same day which it take is a process that takes 6 or 7 months to do right but things were going on at the hospital with your mom so they speeded it up and i got it immediately and in a short time after that my grandmother was granted custody over me as well because if anything happened to my father, anybody could have tried to take me and that, that was not happening. They wouldn't release you to me. Isn't that something? My child, my child, they wouldn't release to me now unless I had it documented. So and I tell people the state owns whatever. Get real legal guardianship of your paper. Exactly. They let you know that you got guardianship of your children. Because that's when they said the state can come in and take your kids. But I got legal guardianship of you. So you belong to me and my mom. <laughs> A lot of folks like that have children, you can have that done until you want legal guardianship of your own children. Because like that, that's when the state comes in and snatch your kids. And they can at will if they wanted to. Mommy signed the paper to make sure there wouldn't be no problems. Because, you know, usually dads didn't get custody of children. They'd give them to mom or whatever or whatnot. And me, thank God I had a good job and, had, and was able to care for you. But we did it legally so mommy could be the back so she could help. Just in case, you know, something ever happened, which is later on. I was an um, inspector for the state of New Jersey, and it was—it was. It was I mean, you know, we looking back 22 years ago, it was a different time in Asia what it is today. They didn't have days I could take off. I was, you know, I was only limited a certain amount of days 22 years ago to be able to take off with her, and um, thank God my mom was there because I had to get back to work. A few things I had to deal with growing up was first living with my grandmother, people kind of not understanding how my mom passed away and understanding that I have to live with my grandmother. You know, I don't really like explaining everything and even now I don't like explaining everything. But, you know, it's just, it's just the way it is in my life. Also growing up, I had a sister. I have a sister. My sister is 27 years old now. She was my mother's first child. And we always live separately. We have a very good relationship. We see each other often, but we just didn't live together. She lives with my mother's family. I live with my father's family. Her father is another man so therefore we didn't live together but we do love each other and growing up was sometimes hard because me and her lived completely different lives and we had totally different outcomes we still have a lot of personality you know that it, we we're still the same a lot of personality wise and we love each other and we get along we're like really good friends but it's it's a big difference in how we grew up so for me I didn't have brothers and sisters in the house every day growing up. You know, I have my one sister that I see sometimes, but for the most part, my cousins are a big part of my life. My cousins almost like everything to me, especially. I have two cousins that I see all the time. They live down the street. My name is Diamond and Dakira. And honestly, like, I just, I love hanging out with them. They're little, they're younger than me, but we grew up really tight. In the neighborhood! It really isn't that bad, you know, like everybody's neighbors and sort of look out for each other. That's one thing I could say they do around here. It's a little hard being in a PWI 
knowing that my area is very black and Latino and people people are kind of scared of Trenton and I don't really understand that as much as I get that our area can have dangers and can be misunderstood that's exactly what it is misunderstood growing up here it was I, I said growing up here and um in the neighborhood we grew up in it was it's definitely was good for her to grow up here it made her who she is it made her know that she can thrive growing up in the um urban neighborhood i come from a place that is known for creating creative people music fashion you know, there are brilliant people in Trenton. There is brilliant. There are brilliant things in Trenton. We are the capital. We have the state house. We have museums. We have Congress people. People really working towards a better tomorrow, and that is what Trenton is to me. That is where I grew up, and that is what I see in myself. So when someone talks bad about where I'm from, they're talking about me. And, you know, my parents raised me here. And I feel like they're, you know, they're talking about my parents. And my parents were raised here, so it's a lot. And where I'm from makes up a lot of who I am. She lived here, we lived here. All the kids, they, they knew her or they knew of her. When people walked by, they was like, well, that's Brianna, you know? They was like, I mean, some people, you know, uh, she don't go to school with us, but she thinks she's better than us. No, it's not that. We want it better for her educational-wise and whatnot because the Trenton Public Schools didn't have nothing to offer her. So I sent her to elsewhere to go to school. I do have a love for children, so I was going to do pediatrics. And now that has molded into me wanting to do social work at some point because I have to, have to, have to help the young children and adolescents in my area as well as other urban cities this the, the amount of self-love that is needed in these communities the amount of help and structure that is needed in these communities is huge and if someone either from their community or from the same background as that community can help that is always better than someone coming in who is on the outside looking in and trying to tell them to change and try to help their situation. Help is great, but an understanding is needed first. And I understand, you know, cause living as a sick child, as a black woman, a black girl in society with a father as your only parent and your grandmother and being chubby, I've never been thin. So I've always been kind of chubby growing up. Just all those things kind of against me. I needed an outlet and I needed to be able to just feel better about the day and writing music and singing and dancing was just something I loved and it was it, I was able to put my energy into that and my anger and my feelings into that um, and you know it manifested to other arts like I love film so that's why I came to college and I was able to do that but yeah the arts was there for me. Really was there for me. We are family. I got all my sisters and me. We are family. Get up everybody and sing. We are family. I got all my sisters with me. We are family. Get up, everybody, and sing. The kids had no problem. I was never aware of any problem with um, other kids in terms of prejudice or anything like that. Something that came into focus a lot in the past five, six years is the definition of race in my family. Um, I'm half black, 
My older brother is half Puerto Rican. My youngest brother is half Mexican. Two of my siblings are black. And one of my sisters is a super racially ambiguous child. And so this concept of race was something that wasn't really brought up until we hit high school. And when I specifically hit college, because it's something we never thought about because my parents treated us like our race didn't matter. When I look in the mirror, I just see my face. I don't see Asian, I don't see white, I don't see anything. I don't consider race a factor. Yes, it is who I am, but it shouldn't, or I believe it shouldn't get in the way of anything. Another thing is, so kind of, like, let's say race, but let's not say just race, let's say color. My father is a darker skinned man, I am a lighter skinned woman and as I was like when I was younger as a young girl I was even lighter than this so a lot of times people were saying things like oh is that your daughter you know or is that your father and people would think that my father's like the, my mother you know was white you know discriminating people upon skin color clearly is just bad but when it comes to interacting with other people that's where it got a little bit funky so i was never really picked on for being adopted but i was picked on for being asian which is also strange um but i think that just has to do with kids being ignorant and just being a kid they don't know much so but then again you do see people who or you do hear of people that are prejudiced and just flat out racist. People do not feel desired because they are darker. People don't feel loved because they are darker. That is insane. People have identity issues because they don't look like their parents, because they're biracial, or because they are light skinned. That's not okay. Like white people would not treat me like I'm white because I'm not white but talking to culturally black people I didn't fit in either and I didn't know how to interact with them just because I don't share the same cultural identifiers as they do you know technically I am white because my parents are white they're the ones who raised me I've learned everything from them I do not live in a Asian influenced household. So me and my father are both black. I'm no, I'm no less, I'm, le I'm not less black than he is because of it. And he's not more black than me because of it. And that just, that has to go away. That mentality of light skin, dark skin. That mentality of lighter is better. It's something that I fight with my parents about sometimes because I'm just like, yeah, I'm not white. You know, like, or I'll be like, oh, like, white people are like, or like talking about white culture in general. And they t they can get very offended because they're like, how do we raise you where, you know, you're talking about white people like this, white people like that. Your parents are white. What do you think about that? I don't want to say that I'm ashamed of being Asian. It's just my relationship to my identity as an Asian person is very complicated because I have been raised by privileged white people. I am proud, very proud to be a black woman. I take pride in my race. I, I, you can't erase it. I cannot erase it. I don't care what shade I am. We are all, we are all black. Intersectionality is very important to me in that sense because my parents are white but they're not straight so their experience is different than someone that would be white and straight um they're also not rich and stuff like that so my idea of intersectionality and how i use that to like talk about feminism and just general things and identity politics in general my parents taught me it was okay to be like fierce to be strong but they also said it's okay to be emotional and it's absolutely okay to have feelings because we are all human 
and we you know we love we hate we cry we have all those emotions another question that's raised a lot is if i would like to find my real parents so the the issue with that question is that what is real there is no such thing as real my parents are my parents they're nothing else mike and lane are my parents being adopted and thinking about familial ties and you know how you're like your parents i don't think it's entirely blood i i don't believe it in the slightest a biological child um you're going to as the kid grows up you're going to say oh that's that's from you you know or oh, that that unfortunately is from me um and you, you say that all the time <laughs> Yeah, you, know, you can identify uh, traits in a child, awesome. either fairly or unfairly. People always do that. But when uh, it's not a biological child and you know nothing about the, uh, the actual uh, parents, everything is a surprise. Out of all the kids, you were the one that, I don't care how bad a situation was, you always found the good in it and you got over it and moved on. Even when you were little. That's just the way you are. Um... And that might have to do with being a foster child before you came to us too and, and learning that that's sometimes what you have to do. But it's probably one of your best qualities because it makes a lot of left, less grief in your life because, okay, it is what it is and you move on. But you usually find the good out of it and make it into something happy. The kid really loved Brianna because that's the type of person she is. She's so easy to get along with. But the thing of it is, Brianna is very easy to get along with. But then people feel they can run over Brianna. That's how nice she is. But she can get very stern, believe me when I tell you. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it's, she's just a nice person. But when she has to, she can really get stern about things. The grace we knew in China is in a lot of ways the grace of today. It's the stubbornness, the uh, determination, um, the intelligence and all of it was evident very early and it, it's the personality is uh, is a, a strong one but uh, it seems to me to be consistent I think it's purely who she is she hasn't changed since the day we met her no <laughs> you you um, <laughs> is that one of those nature's worth versus nurture questions yep <laughs> it's yeah <clears throat> um, that's a hard question. I don't, I don't know. I mean, you're you haven't changed. You really were the same when you were little. Um, you haven't really changed. You've been you've been the course all along. So I don't know how to answer that one. Brianna always been a real smart girl. I mean, she watches, looks, and listens. She don't miss nothing, I must tell you that. She don't miss nothing. Now you don't miss nothing. No, she don't. Still, to this day. No, she, she's bright. Everything is uh, either uh, you know, a wonderful gift opening up or a hideous uh, Pandora's box opening, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think it kind of makes it uh, more interesting to see um, uh, uh, and to bring an infant home, um, watch them grow through uh, childhood and uh, into womanhood, and um, and f and find out new stuff all the time. You know, you make what is happy. You make you know who you really do consider a part of everything. We did in vitro fertilization. And uh, Lane actually got pre pregnant. And we lost the child at uh, four months, which today would be virtually viable, but it wasn't then. And um, I still think about the little boy. But the thing is, if he had lived or had been able to be saved, we never would have gone to China. 
and I wouldn't trade grace for anything. Even flesh and blood. If there's one message that any adopted kid will tell you, it's that biological ties never matter. It only matters who loves you and who will be there to do the right thing for you and to be supportive of who you are.